On April 29th, 1975, the city of Saigon was about to fall. Sarah Errington had arrived in Saigon from Devon ten, ten days before. An experienced photographer who had travelled the length of Africa twice, documenting refugee camps for Oxfam and the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. She was in Vietnam with an assignment to do the same for the camps of Vietnamese and Cambodian refugees outside Saigon. She had heard, as had the rest of the world, that the communist forces from the north were advancing on South Vietnam. She hoped for the opportunity to shoot combat, as she had in Ethiopia in the early 1970s. It was not to be. The North Vietnamese army advanced too quickly. Errington completed her work for the UNHCR and found a job with Associated Press. She had submitted just a few days' worth of work when, on the morning of April 29th, she woke up in a city on the brink of change. On her walk from her hotel room at the Caravelle to the AP offices, she saw men in the uniform of the South Vietnamese Army crouching behind bins to change into civilian clothes. At the office, she learnt from George Esper, then the senior figure for AP in Vietnam, that the Vietnamese darkroom technician had not come into work. A likely northern sympathiser, she had decided it was not worth the risk. At the same time, photographers for AP were out capturing the fall as it happened. When I interviewed Errington in 2019, she would recalled a distinct feeling that history was happening in the city outside the office doors. It would not be long before the first reels of film came in for processing, and she was the only person in the office with the technical know-how to do it. Errington went into the darkroom. Work came in from her colleagues positioned out in the city. Her close friend and fellow female photographer, Frances Starner, had taken pictures of a tank rolling through the gates of the presidential palace. Errington moved from developing tank to fixing tank. She wished she was out there doing the exciting work of photographing, but she stuck with the task that she had been assigned. Outside the darkroom, she could hear voices speaking Vietnamese, the familiar sound of rubber flip-flops. If anyone opened the door to the darkroom before the films were out of the fixing tank, these pieces of history would be lost. The last of the pictures fixed, Errington stepped out of the darkroom and took a photograph of the scene she saw. This image would be published all over the world. AP journalists Peter Arnett, Matt Frangiola and George Esper stand frozen, poring over a map as two North Vietnamese soldiers demonstrate the route they took into the city. This image fits neatly into a narrative, established over the preceding decade, of Vietnam journalism as masculine adventure. That this photograph, or many others from that chaotic day, was ever seen, is down to the efforts of a woman photographer. The photographs now safely developed, Errington and two of her male colleagues tried to travel to the nearby communications building to put them on the wire machine. This plan was quickly abandoned when soldiers occupying the building fired warning shots at their feet. Knowing that many of the images would be censored or destroyed if they tried to send them out through traditional means, the AP team instead handed off envelopes of photographs to what they called pigeons, couriers who secreted the photographs around their person as they boarded flights out of Saigon. This photograph was among them. This anecdote sheds light on the role, not only of women photographers, but of darkroom professionals in the production of journalistic narratives of the Vietnam War. While most of the name recognition and acclaim went to white American men, who often emphasised their close proximity to the conflict, their photographs would never have made it out of Vietnam without the undervalued work of developing them. This work was typically undertaken by local Vietnamese employees. And as Errington's anecdote shows, when these employees were unavailable, the responsibility fell to a woman staffer. Arnett, Frangiola and Esper all left Saigon within six weeks. Errington and Starner stayed on. According to Errington, Esper left her in charge of photographs from the now depleted Saigon Bureau, while Starner handled copy. Errington stayed in-country later than almost any other Western journalist, finally leaving in September 1975. This marks the end of an almost continuous presence in Vietnam of white female photographers 
which started in 1961, before the official start of the American involvement in Vietnam. These photographers, from France, America and Britain, were present for the official deployment of US troops in 1965, for the Tet Offensive in 1968, for the official end of the war with the signing of the Paris Agreements in 1973, and in the case of Errington and many of her uh, female peers, they were also there for what was at the time referred to as the fall of Saigon, which we now might think about as the liberation or the reunification of Vietnam. Their role in the documentation of the war and its 